Spanning the nerd world and feeding your fandom. It's time for the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Here's your host, James Witham. Proof that you never know what's going to be falling from the sky. It's episode 356 of the Down and Nerdy Podcast. I'm James Witham, and man... Do we have an interview-packed show for you this week? Just sort of worked out that way. Actually going to feature a couple of the stars of the brand new NBC sci-fi series, Debris. Going to talk talk to Scroobius Pip and Norbert Leo Butts about their major roles coming up on this first season before the show premieres on March the 1st on NBC. Also going to have yet another interview from Tell Me Your Secrets when I do my spoiler-ish review of that here coming up. Also going to talk to Steve French, who's the narrator of the new Unsolved Mysteries podcast. If you lo- love Unsolved Mysteries, you're going to want to hear what he has to say. Plus an insane amount of nerd news this week and a whole bunch more. Plus Care Of is back as a sponsor of the podcast this week and to tell you how you can get your vitamins and supplements delivered right to your door. But first, my interview from Tell Me Your Secrets and my spoiler-filled review. We'll also hear from Kiara Alura and Ashley Madwake coming up next on the Down and Nerdy Podcast. This is Brittany Ishibashi from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Out of the Shadows, and you're listening to the Down and Nerdy Podcast. The secret is out, and it turns out you guys really love Tell Me Your Secrets from Amazon Prime Videos from what you've been telling me about the interviews that we had last week from the show, and I can't blame you. And right now, I'd like to do a little bit of a spoiler-ish review of the first season of Tell Me Your Secrets. Of course, the story really centers around a few different characters. You've got Lily Rabe's character of Emma Hall slash Karen Miller. You, you know that from the very first episode going. And, and she, of course, was involved with Parker, who was a... It turns out he was a serial killer. And did she know? Did she not know? That's one of the secrets of the show. We also follow Mary Barlow's character, who's played by Amy Brenneman, and she kind of gets tied to John Tyler, who's played by Hamish Linkletter. Now... Mary is obsessed with the disappearance slash possible murder of her daughter that could be tied back to this serial killer, Parker. So, you know, of course, she wants to find who she knows as Karen Miller. Of course, we know as Emma Hall to see what she knows, because Parker, big spoiler alert here, Parker dies in the very beginning of this series. So, yeah, and it looks like he kills himself in his cell after he finds out that Karen, who he knows is Karen, we know as Emma, was released from prison. So, and and sort of moved on from him. And then Emma ends up becoming Emma because of her therapist, and that's who's played by Enrique Murciano, Murciano, excuse me, who is Peter Guillory. And I will say, Peter is the guy that I was suspicious of right off the jump. This guy, he, he's a therapist, but there's something really there was something really weird about him. Something not quite right. There and he's actually tied to he's actually married. He actually ended up marrying one of his patients, Lisa, who I mean, I mean, conflict of interest. Yeah, sure. You'd think so. And she's played by Ashley Medwake. And I actually want to play right now before I get too much into my review. I want to play my last interview from Tell Me Your Secrets. And it's with Ashley and Kiara Aurelia, who plays Rose and Rose plays a big part in this story as well. So let's go ahead and hear from Kiara and Ashley. Then I'll jump back in with the rest of my review of tell me your secrets. All right, Kiara, Ashley, thank you so much for doing the time and taking the time to do this day. Kiara, I actually want to start with you. When we first meet Rose, you kind of feel like, you know, she's just going to be your stereotypical mean girl, but she's absolutely not that at all. So much more to her. So how did you feel as you kept learning more about the role, knowing that she was going to be just more than that? I, I felt it was really, a uh, really interesting character to play. I mean, you end up realizing with most people as well as characters that there's a lot more going on behind the surface that has an evolution to what they become and the behaviors and mannerisms that they have. And I think it was really interesting for me to explore why she had um, the attitude (laughs) that she did and why she had this hatred and cruelty within her. And I think over the course of the story, you end up seeing her family life as well as her personal struggles and, you know, the difficulty she faces within the town and, you know, in her new relationship with Emma as well, which is always very interesting. I, I, I think it's great to play someone who is 
you ex it's you know we don't judge a book by its cover. Uh, you see one thing, but there's a whole a whole backstory there, which ends up being a lot more interesting. <laughs> Absolutely, and Ashley, I, I think that I was suspicious of Peter right from the mm. jump when I was watching this show. So, do you think that? Lisa knows him better than anyone else, or is it not that simple? I think Lisa would like to think that she knows him better than anybody else. But as the story progresses and as Lisa grows, she quickly starts to realize that there's a lot that she doesn't know about her husband and a lot that she hasn't really reconciled within their relationship. The dynamic of their relationship is really intense, I think. You know, him being her therapist, I don't know how professional that is or if, <laughs> like in the real world. So it definitely speaks to who he is as a man and also who she is as a woman that she was open to that, receptive to that. I think there's a lot of control issues in that relationship. So for the both of you, we get to learn some pretty big things about both of your characters later on in the season. So of course we don't want to spoil anything, but how much are you both looking forward to the fan reaction when those secrets do get revealed? I love watching this kind of TV show. I love anything that's got mystery and suspense, cliffhangers, I'm all about it. And I am that audience member who thinks I know exactly what's happening from episode one. Like I know who did the murder. I know who did everything. And I annoy anyone who's watching it with me. Um, so I hope that we trick people. I hope they think they know what's going on and they don't. Yeah, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of twists and turns and nothing really as is as it seems, mm. um, which is really amazing to watch. And as an audience viewer, I almost kind of wish I could watch it again for the first time and re read it again for the first time because I had no idea what was going to end up happening in the end, which I think is very fun. So again, without spoiling anything really quickly, Kiara, Kiara how would you describe the nature of Emma and, and your character's relationship, at Rose? Because it's an interesting one, I think. It's definitely an interesting one. Uh, how do I put this into proper words? I think that there's, with a lot of a lot of different character dynamics, there's a young girl who's looking for support and someone who can be there for her and love her and nurture her and be kind to her in the way that she deserves. And I think it's interesting to see how that evolves and what kind of toxic and unhealthy situations can come of a child in need of love. Absolutely. Amazing. Both of you are amazing in the show. Can't wait for people to see it. Thank you so much for taking the time today. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And that's interesting to me because as you hear them both talk about their characters, I want to go back to, to Lisa for a second because she thinks, yeah, she knows her husband, Peter, but at the same time, she also knows that something's not right about him. I mean, when he, when you're a therapist, you can't really share much anyway. You can't really share anything about your patients, even when you're significant other or you're not supposed to. Anyway, so I, of course she's going to be a little weary and suspicious of that, especially since, hey, I mean, that's how they got started, right? And he knows he's got this new patient. She knows she, he's got this new patient in Emma who he seems to be paying a lot of attention to. And I could see there being some paranoia there. Plus, he's also tied to this this group home that's part of this small Louisiana town where, where he's got Emma holed up in his cabin, by the way. So... You know, there's a lot of weird stuff going on there. So I'm immediately suspicious of Peter or, or Pete, or whatever you want to call him. And you come to find out that's one of the beauty parts about this show, about Tell Me Your Secrets. There's so much misdirection in this show that really tries to keep you off balance and make you wonder if you know exactly what's going on. And I love that about a show. I don't want to know right away all of the details or have all of the clues right away. This show actually does a great job. When it does give you clues, it staggers them out throughout several episodes. And and sometimes the clues can be misdirections and sometimes they're actual clues. You just have to figure that out for yourself. And that's one of the cool things about this show. And you know, you've also got Emma trying to balance. Is she really trying to make a new life in Louisiana? She's told to stay away from young girls. She can't seem to do that because for some reason, they're just drawn to her. And that's when Rose is one of those characters. Now, she ends up smashing Rose's face into a mirror defending another girl because Rose was being a bully. Right. But then Rose ends up kind of taking to Emma. And you see how Rose has a terrible home life, as you heard Kiara tease a few minutes ago. And that kind of leads her to, for the lack of a better term, fall in love with Emma. And that turns into a very destructive relationship from from Rose's perspective. Anyway, 
So that ends up becoming another side story in all this. And what really happened to Emma when she thought she saw one of the other girls that she befriended, that, that she thought she saw them dead in the swamp? Well, did she or didn't she? Was she involved and she just didn't realize it? Is that is there a certain sense to her mental illness that we're not seeing out of this? It's so the, the as the secret is just as much about Emma slash Karen as it is about anybody else. But it all you also see it draw things out. In certain characters, like you could see Mary Barlow do something that is completely 100% just off the rails, unforgivable, right? And then you see a guy like John Tyler, who she's connected with. She hires him to find out what happened with her, with her daughter and to find this Karen Miller so she can ask her some questions. And you see John, and he's a predator. He's a sexual predator. He's convicted sexual predator who's trying to put his life back together so you really don't have any sympathy for this guy but at the same time you could see he's on the right path and you could see being involved with mary barlow is triggering him and it's starting to see you start to see you know parts of his old life sort of start to seep out and you kind of see the slow descent back into the the madman that he was and the just the disgusting human being that he was and and you know it's like, do you create the villains that you that you're trying to fight against? And, and with Mary's foundation, she kind of does that. But at the same time, she's unleashing this predator on the world at the same time, too. Right. In a certain sense. So there's this there's that other side story and how her son, her, she has a son who she almost ignores because of what's going on with her daughter, the search for her daughter, where she just will not give up hope. So you've got poor Jake, who's played by Elliot Fletcher, trying to keep himself together, trying to keep the family together, trying to keep his mom together. And she's also keeping him in the dark about a whole bunch of things. So, I, I, I mean, I could go on about the show for a while. So to, to sum it up, and I don't want to spoil the ending either, because I think that's a, that's, a, that's a really lousy thing to do. But, you know, we've got Emma, who's trying to put her life together she's, so she can be... Spoiler alert again, so she can be prepared to, to bring her daughter back. She get, actually gave up a child when all this stuff started happening. Now she wants to get her daughter back, and whether that's a good idea or not, who knows. But she's trying to put her life together there. She's got a new love interest in her life, and, and Tom Johnston, who's a, who's a police officer in this town. You know, th- funny that she'd, pro- she'd try to get involved with a police officer, keeping being that she's trying to keep a low profile. So it's almost like a, does she want to have this new life or not? Is Pete really trying to help her or not? What happens if, and when John does find her and how he decides to proceed from there? And what happens when somebody finds out? Because I can tell you without spoiling anything that there's a couple of characters here already that either know what's going on with Emma or suspect that something's going on with her. And what really happened with Teresa Barlow? That's the other thing that happens here. So this is a multi-layered mystery story that you're probably not going to have figured out for quite a while, if at all. So if you really like a good thriller, a good psychological mystery type situation, and the swamp in Louisiana plays just as much of a factor as a character, I think as anything else, this couldn't be, couldn't be a more perfect setting. This is not like New Orleans either. This is deep swamp, small town territory. So it's really, really neat. And I just think if you really like these deep mystery stories, if you like not knowing what's going on, if you like the misdirection and you like to be surprised, tell me your secrets is a show that you absolutely should be watching on Amazon Prime Video. That's going to do it for my spoiler-ish review and interviews with Kiara Alaria and Ashley Madwake of Tell Me Your Secrets. Up next, going to jump into another brand new show, this one from NBC. Going to talk to a couple stars of the brand new sci-fi series Debris on NBC. Going to talk to Scroobius Pip and Norbert Leo Butts next on the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Hi, this is Melissa Rockford from Manifest, and you're listening to the Down and Nerdy Scroobius Norbert, good afternoon, gentlemen. Really looking forward to diving into talking about Debris. Actually, to me, as I was watching the first episode, I'm like, it's really refreshing that this show kind of starts off where these, this Debris, these artifacts are kind of already well-established in the yeah. show. Do you feel like kind of skipping over that typical, you know, origin, what is this kind of story actually helps get the show moving faster? Completely. I completely think that's the case. I think particularly in sci-fi and obviously in comic book, 
we we do origin so regularly and so over and over again and as we're kind of seeing in the sci-fi adventure that we're living in in the real world at the moment it's what happens a little bit down the line that is is truly fascinating see so, yeah, i love that we get in there and it's it's already established it's already already in the world and the players are already on the board i agree what the audience will learn is that the you know we've been tracking this debris for for several months now my character craig would have been probably tracking it for the past couple of years so this has really been his whole life so that you're right as soon as the audience drops in i like i like a show where i have to do a little bit of work like oh wow they're really going for it man they're mm -hmm. jumping right in i like that very much about it there's a there's a great tempo to it the other thing i thought was cool was that you know, normally when you have shows and it's about aliens, right? It's about alien life. This is about basically alien stuff. It's alien debris. So was it kind of cool to maybe take a different angle that way as well? Yeah, a hundred percent. Because again, why would why would we assume that these mad, unimaginable aliens fly about in metal s spaceships that with with elements that we're completely familiar with that that react in a way that we're completely familiar with? So it's great to have that and. Again, it becomes that more relatable section of sci-fi where what we're looking at is the effects on us as humans. We're not really, you know, it is wonderful to see all the crazy things that they can do, but it's seeing what this debris can do, but how that affects us, how it affects the relationships, particularly between Brian and Fanola, but definitely between Brian and Maddox, um, the, the whole angle of, of my team of people that again more will come as we go on that it's showing how it affects humans rather than just going oh look at this cool alien stuff yeah i agree the the show is really a mystery um, the audience has to do uh get the fun of trying to solve this mystery as well and that we're dealing with something obviously we're the debris the audience will learn are these small particles, you know, these fragments that have come from, from this thing. But what's ha what uh, the sort of paranormal stuff that that's happening? We we don't know what it is yet. It's it's ephemeral. It we can't see it. And I think that's so prescient, you know, for what we're dealing with with right now with the pandemic. I I get chills sometimes when I read the scripts because we're not we're not doing a contagion type of it's not it's not that type of a show. But we are talking about the limitations of the human mind and limitations of science, what trying to solve a mystery that is invisible is what's really at the heart of the show. And the race geopolitically to contain this stuff, to figure out, you know, to keep it to out of the hands of the bad guys. To take control of it, keep it out of the hands of the bad guys, even keep it out of the hands of some of the good guys. <laughs> It, 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 I like that the show works both as, as sci-fi, but there, there's, there's also international or geopolitical thriller aspect of it that I like very much. It's funny that you touched on that, Norbert, because I was going to ask, is it, do you feel like it's obvious who the good guys actually are in this show? No, it, it, it's difficult to ascertain who the good guys are in the show, and it's very difficult to ascertain who the good guys are Truly, when we talk about special ops, when we talk about paramilitary, uh, highly secretive, soldier spying, that whole world, the reason that it exists outside of the military and the government in this kind of secret space is because of that very thing. Human morality has to stay very, very, very fluid. <laughs> People are able to compartmentalize, do terrible things in the moment, for a bigger payoff later on. Most people can't operate on that level. Most people, have, we compartmentalize, right? And we're binary thinkers. People like Pip's character and my character, no. <laughs> we are able to, much more fluid between those areas and, and able to compartmentalize much more. And uh, I mean, that was, that blurred line was one of the things that really appealed to me about the character because he, Anson is clearly presented as at first on paper as a bad guy, right? As 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 part of the bad guys, but it's creepy Brit we, number we, one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if, if we break it down, that, yeah, tell tell him that's what you were called in the script. That was originally in, in in the original script. C D wow. Brit number one. Oh wow! Imagine, wow. imagine getting Even that email worse. from your oh, agent. Oh wow! <laughs> I've got the perfect role for you. So we can't tell you your Brit character's name, but <laughs> yeah, but. What was cool was then realizing, right, well, Anson believes that the American and the British government 
shouldn't be trusted to take control of this this technology and shouldn't be trusted with power and it shouldn't be kept from the people and i'm reading that going how's this a bad guy how how's this not a good guy because again i genuinely in the real world believe that we've got so many documentaries that show how mismanaged power has been when put in the hands of governments and particularly in espionage type areas of the government where it's all secretive and under lock of key so yeah instantly i was like well i think he's the good guy and i'm hoping that a lot of the audience will start to, to come over to his I side i think you're going to be sorely disappointed pip i think you're going to be sorely disappointed <laughs> oh the rivalry is fresh on this one i love it's it there. i love it so well, my favorite my favorite thing i got to, sh to shoot were on episode nine but the scenes that i've gotten to do with pip have been definitely definitely my favorite because i very much like that you know in a, in a binary you know good guy bad guy world it would be very, very clear and pat, but because of the nature of the show, because of the nature of, because of human nature, Pip is, is right. He, through, through a different lens, you are able to see these guys uh, in a much more complicated light. Well, both of them truly believe that they're doing what's right. It, like, it's the sole motivation for, for what they're doing. And as, as, as you've said, like Craig, as an example, is having to make some really tough choices on family life on friends on on mm. relationships but it's because he truly believes what he's doing is right and similar uh, uh, with anson there's almost a disposableness which is, uh. is, is 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 trained into soldiers and special ops people and that's because you or to have that disposableness you need to believe in in your calls so yeah, yeah. it's great w w we get when to... they come to head yeah, yeah. We, we, it's it's really great. We get to have this sort of we, our characters in our scene together. We really pose like an existential question, you know, to the to the viewer. Do you know, do people act finally in self interest or altruistically? Do you know what's yeah. what 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 really is at what's at the heart? Um, and and that's so that's so interesting when you think about it. You know, pol politics and and warfare. Because this is really what this is. It's 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 an intelligence warfare. It's a tech war. It's a tech war. I think it's fantastic that on a network show, you know, and in entertainment that you know, and the show is is going to be extremely entertaining. But I like that in Joel's work, he makes room for for bigger questions. If the if the viewer choose, you know, cares to to think about them, they're there. Digging deep. I love it. I love it. I, I, actually, as I was watching the show, I'm seeing the effects that this debris can actually have on the different characters. Were you guys kind of surprised as you were going through each episode what effects this debris actually had on people, what this stuff could do, and maybe does that kind of bring out more of these character moments in the show? 100% the, the, the excitement and mystery of what the effects are going to be is one of the things that had me excited to get each new script. And I think it's one of the things that will have people excited to watch each new episode because there is a case of the week kind of side to our our, our journey here so and it's kind of the possibilities are endless that's kind of the the beauty of it is we get that excitement of what is the next piece gonna do so yeah yeah i love that and i love seeing the effects it has on the individuals and on the relationships of the individuals like because again particularly when everyone involved is in some kind of area of espionage here how much is between craig and brian and kept from F finola how much is between Brian and Fanola and kept from Craig. How much does Anson know that none, none of them know about? And yeah, it's this constant tug of war there. Yeah, with each episode, we find out the depth of the power of this matter. Of course, the more we learn, the higher the stakes get in controlling it, possessing it, and beating our enemies. So as the audience is learning, oh my God, wormholes opening up, cloning happening we did we, we we can't we haven't even scraped the surface of, of how powerful this stuff is right and i like that with each lesson we learn emotionally we have to we dig down deeper in our quest to, to figure it out yeah there's a, there's a lot of bad players in the world i'm looking at you <clears throat> See, he could have been pointing at me, though, and that now, see, now I'm paranoid, and that's just from watching 100%. the shows. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm going to go. I'm going to go with the guy that has a, a beard bigger than my first New York City apartment. <laughs> <laughs> 
So let's talk about the good guys for a second. Or I should say good guys in, in air quotes. Let's say good guys. So how shaky is this relationship between the two agencies, Norbert? And maybe, Srubius, does your character, can you kind of play these two against each other a little bit? Well, yeah, it's, I mean, it's shaky because of our characters, I think. Because of, of Brian's relationship with Craig and Fanola's relationship with who she thinks to be her deceased dad, but who I'm kind of have some kind of connection to that will all unfold down the lines. So, yeah, I think their relationship is one of the most human parts of the show, is watching, particularly Brian, I found, struggle with wanting to do what his kind of father figure, older brother figure and boss has asked of him and, you know, connect him with this other agent that he can kind of see as a good person. So it's that, yeah, it starts to blur that line. Yeah, again, I find the more we learn about the characters and the more I sort of checked out different CIA narratives, whether paramilitary or special ops or whatever, the thing I find the most fascinating, and the show does a really good job of this, is how guys who work in fields like my character would, who, you know, one book we call, we refers to guys like Brian and Craig as warrior spies, you know, this idea that they, as, as, as fearless and uh, you know exemplary as they are as soldiers, you know just courage, fitness, um, you know just mental strength, all of those soldier qualities. That this strategical, scientific quality is is also there. These are guys who would be really proficient in really complicated tech, multilinguists, right? So my character would have several languages. We're talking about really big brains, right? Almost to the point where I, you know. I sit here going, uh, how, how is anybody ever going to believe I'm this smart? But what I do find that I, I, I like to play is this idea that as human beings, what they're trying to do is compartmentalize everything in their mind to keep the, the wife and the kid separate from the international bad guy, separate from the lab work that I'm doing. This idea that a person can be made up of different, different things. And in my character, you know, that really starts to take a toll on this guy. People are people, you know, at the, at the base of it. I really like that about the show for the strangeness and, and, you know, epicness of the mystery that we're trying to solve. Joel has done a really good job of, of, of creating individual, you know, real human beings. So as the season goes on, you see my character struggle with continuing to compartmentalize. His wife is not in this field. His son is not in this field. Watching Craig balance those two those two lives is, is really interesting and very moving i think and you guys will find out march 1st that's a monday that's when the series premiere of debris happens you guys i can't wait for you guys to see it. it's Hip. it's norbert leo butts thank you so much for joining me gentlemen thank you Thanks, man. that is one of the things i really love about this show is that there's sci-fi there but there's really a character driven show that really tries to make you guess okay who are the good guys who are the bad guys and what is going on with this stuff? There's so many layered mysteries here. So make sure you're watching Debris on March the 1st on NBC. I think this is one of those shows that you're really, really going to dig. So I can't wait for you to get the chance to see the premiere. This week, the Down and Nerdy podcast once again, once again brought to you by Care of Wellness Brand that helps you maintain your health goals with a customized vitamin plan. Well, how do they customize it? You go to TakeCareOf.com. You take the really quick online quiz. It takes like five minutes. You answer some really simple questions. And yeah, you end up with a, a tailored approach to your unique health needs. You, you get all these different vitamins and supplements that you can choose from. And one of the things that I really love, not just the fact that they come in little packs that are personalized for you. It helps you to remember to take the stuff that you want to take every day. But also, if you're not sure, you want to know what you're putting into your body, right? So they have all the studies that go in to all of these supplements and maybe some stuff that you haven't heard of, you're not sure about it. They have the studies right up there that show you the data that they came up with to why this is suggested for this. Like, this is why this is suggested to help you with your, you know, with your short-term memory and things like that. So you you know what you're putting into your body. You know exactly what the studies are. So that really was, a, especially for me, I could be a skeptic about stuff that I've never heard of before. So it was really cool to be able to get that in-depth analysis of that stuff. And basically this helps you 
you know, make those changes that you want to make in your life or it helps you make your health a priority. And that's one of the things you can get if you go to TakeCareOf.com. As a matter of fact, you can get 50% off your first order at TakeCareOf.com with promo code NERDY50. So yeah, go there, take the quick online quiz, and maybe there'll be some stuff there that you didn't even think that you might need. They're going to give you these recommendations for these daily individual wrap packs of vitamins, and you can get into a routine to really help you follow that when you go to TakeCareOf.com. Enter promo code NERDY50 to get your 50% off of your first order at Care Of. Start making your health a priority and let Care Of help you do just that. Once again, I want to thank Scroobius Pip and Norbert Leo Butts for chatting with me about debris this week. Make sure you're watching it on NBC March the 1st. Up next, going to dive into yet another interview. Yeah, let's talk about the new Unsolved Mysteries podcast with narrator Steve French. Up next on the Down and Nerdy Podcast. This is David Sobolov, voice of Grodd on The Flash and Drax on Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy. And you're listening to the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Now you guys know that Unsolved Mysteries has been back on Netflix for a little bit now, but did you know that it is also a podcast? I can't believe it's actually taken this long, but this guy is the narrator of the brand new Unsolved Mysteries podcast, which you can get anywhere you get your podcast. It's Steve French. Steve, how's it going? It's James. It's so, it's still, I have to admit, it's so weird to hear somebody say that I'm the voice of Unsolved Mysteries. It's very strange. still very surreal. It's got to have me on. It's got to be cool, man. I mean, Unsolved Mysteries has kind of brought back some incredible stories. It's always had incredible stories. One of the things, though, that kind of put the original show kind of over the top for me was the hosting and narration by the late, great Robert Stack. So what's it like to now kind of carry on that legacy in this form? It's a pretty weighty responsibility, right? I mean, there's no way that anyone anywhere could do what uh, Robert Stack did. But I feel a great responsibility to to carry on sort of the imprint of this iconic brand. I, I went back and, and made I, I was a big Unsolved Mysteries fan, of course, and a huge Robert Stack fan growing up as a kid. And so I, I, when, I, when I found out that I was going to be doing this, I went back and started to watch a little bit of him. And I said, I can't do this to myself because I'm, I'm just I'll never be able to do what he does. And I'll be trying to imitate him the whole time. So, I, you know, my hope has always been try to try to bring a, a you know the sense of that and pay homage to what unsolved mysteries is and what people know and expect from it but do that in, in the way that i can on the flip side of that though could you kind of approach it to the, by looking at it as if to say you know now you could be introducing this great show slash podcast to an entirely new generation now that's never even seen that original version Absolutely. That's a, that's such a great point. You know, I mean, these are all new stories. It's not like we're redoing the old episodes or something. So, it, so it, you know, first of all, the audience that's hearing this, especially the younger generation, I mean, these are going to be their unsolved mystery stories that, that they know firsthand. And uh, of course, we hope they go back and, and see the other ones. But yeah, I mean, and, and it's exciting in this in this form. It's, it's different, of course, from, from being on TV. So I hope that I hope that people are happy to have a, a narrator back and, and sharing these stories with them. It's, it's been really exciting. And I think Unsolved Mysteries lends itself perfectly to the audio format. It's, it's one of those things where I, I, I try to listen to the scratch episodes that they send me to, to get ready for our recording sessions. I try to listen to them in bed uh, be, you know, before I go to bed at night, and I have to turn them off and listen to them the next day because many of them are just too spooky for me to, to make it through. So. <laughs> I, I hear that, man. It's the first one, especially. We'll get to that in a second. But I feel like this is one of those shows where you kind of never really know what to expect week to week. I mean, one week it's a ghost story. Next week it could be an unexplained death or disappearance. Is it kind of something that really drew you to a project like this? Absolutely. From the from the get go, you know, when I got the audition for this, you know, for this voiceover gig, that that was what they were looking for: was somebody that could show a range of emotions as a narrator. Because exactly as you said, every week is going to be different with us. You know, and people who know unsolved mysteries know that they're are so many different stories we cover and the narrator was going to have to be able to find his way into those stories and lead the listeners along in those different areas yeah it's always something new i'm always fascinated just when you think you've kind of heard everything if you think you've got got the the true crime genre figured out something new comes up I, I, it's amazing the stories they compiled and every week I, i'm fascinated it, it never gets old now, to me, you, you were talking about how you kind of get you get drawn in by these stories, right? I mean, you're not just the narrator that just kind of rolls in there. You read the script and you're out. The, you, how can you not get drawn in by something like this? Do you actually have a particular like genre of story that you, that interests you the most? Are you a ghost story guy? Are you more of a true crime guy? Where are you at? 
Well, I've always been, my friends will tell you, and I hope you don't have them on a podcast. My friends will tell you that I've always been famously a, a scaredy cat, you know, in college going to a, you know, a haunted house or something. And I, I would be the one staying in the car and wanting everybody to come back and drive me home. But, uh, you know, I, 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 on sort of a more serious note, I think the ones that, that really draw me in and affect me the most are probably, I mean, they're all, they're all gripping in one way or another, but as the father of, of a young boy, I, I think, you know, anytime we have a story about missing or abducted children or children who have perished, those really kind of level me out. And, you know, just as, as a human being and certainly as a father, those, those to me are the, are the toughest. So I wouldn't say I'm certainly not a fan of those stories. You wish those stories never had to be told, but those that, you know, this isn't just, you know, when I came across as an audition, it was, oh, here's this, what, what, what would this potential job be? This, it isn't a job anymore. You know, it's, it's, you're telling the stories of people who have suffered something very serious in one way or another. And I try to take that responsibility very seriously to try to try to find some, some closure, try to try to help solve these mysteries. That's a, that's something I kind of think gets lost in the shuffle with a show like this. And people kind of forget that is that you guys kind of bring back the call to action at the end of every podcast, you know, if you have information or if you want more information on this, was that something that was like, like you said, also important to you? Do you think that is kind of something that, you know, gets lost in the whole spotlight of, Oh, this is a really interesting story. Absolutely. It's, I'm so happy to hear you say that because I hope more people will, will realize that too. You know, I mean, Unsolved Mysteries is, a, is, is this very iconic brand. We, we kind of know what it is, but it really is. It, it's this very vital living, breathing organism that, that it exists. To try to help people, it, uh, it, it's it's probably my favorite part of each recording session is recording that call to action and being very specific about how people can reach out and and help those that they've just been listening about. Yeah, it is. It's really important. It, it takes it to a whole new level. You know, this this it isn't just yes, it has a cult following. Yes, it's this very famous thing, and we can have fun getting spooked out by something. But on the other hand, it's very serious, and it's why the show has been around for so long because it provides such a vital vital service talking to steve french who's the narrator of the new unsolved mysteries podcast from cadence 13 and cosgrove mirror productions which you can get wherever you get your podcast every wednesday now steve the first episode takes place in ball cemetery which definitely gave me the chills for more reasons than one that's for sure so knowing what you know now and i guess what you just said about yourself a few minutes ago would you go anywhere within a 50 mile radius of this place <laughs> I didn't even want to record the episode. I, was so scared, <laughs> but, I mean, it, it is a fascinating location. And, you know, lo I, I was looking up the pictures from the place. Just terrified. I don't know how anybody knows, certainly after listening to our episode, but, it, 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 you know, it's this kind of legendary place that when, you know, for people that, that kind of live nearby, I don't know how anybody can go near it. I really don't. I mean, are you somebody that would want to go do this? Do you want to hop into a place like this? Are you kind of a ghost uh, aficionado? Funny story, Steve. I actually spent about almost a year as a paranormal investigator, actually. So you're, you're kidding me. No, I'm not kidding. And I've been to some crazy, crazy places. I've actually, I've done the investigations. I've, I still have the equipment. But this place, I don't know. I was getting chill bumps just from the episode. Now, I'm a pretty brave guy when it comes to stuff like this. But this, I don't know. This one seems like it's on another level for me. Yeah, it really was. I mean, you know, the, the whole, the, the possession, the disappearing cars. And I've seen since the episode came out, I, I, I on social media, I saw a few comments of other people that said, I had the same experience with a car that disappeared, you know, that disappeared behind us after we left. I mean, guys, don't. Please don't go to Ball Cemetery, okay? So listen to the episode and let that be a warning. Just don't go. Don't go. Don't don't chance anything. Yeah, it's, a, it's a wild place. There's like Very several. You you warn people like several times in the episode not to go there. That's the funny. That was the that was one thing. If I could get a chuckle out of anything from that episode, I can think of three specific times where you're like, guys, don't go there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and not not only, but it, it, not only is it just you know, because it's so spooky and who knows what's going to happen. But I mean, legally, you're not supposed to be going there. There's a caretaker with a shotgun who will chase people off and, you know, you'll get arrested. I mean, it really is not, it's just not, uh, not a place to go hang out, you know? So, so please folks, listen to your narrator. All right. Not exactly a welcome sign on, on the front gate or anything like that. That's for sure. Yeah, now, exactly. Steve, exactly. We, you were talking about the big responsibility of this, and, and I agree with you. I actually think it, it really is. But you actually kind of had that added responsibility in this medium because 
You're responsible now for painting the picture of these settings. You're, you're setting the tone. Talk about the process that goes on with the writers and the producers and everyone in putting these episodes together to, together to be able to actually bring that to the forefront. Yeah, so I mean, I'm working with incredible producers. Obviously, Terry Dunmure is the original, one of the original producers, along with John Cosgrove, and working with Boyd Lockridge and Paige Heinsohn at uh, Cadence 13. So they, they have been doing the interviews. They're doing the incredible sound design. They take the episodes and they, they put them together, and then we record two episodes a day every other week. So we, we meet on Mondays and we record in the afternoon. And we've got a pretty good shorthand going now, how we're able to kind of get through the episodes. So I'm, I'm sort of one of the last pieces of their puzzle, you know, get, once they're putting the whole episode together. And they, they always send me the scratch of the episode so I can hear, you know, the actual episode that you're going to hear minus my voice. Lloyd does a great job doing the scratch scratches for us. Then we go in and, you know, the writing is so good that it's all relatively self-explanatory, you know. I mean, I think if there's anything major, Terry's been doing this forever so she knows i mean she's so detail oriented and so good and so quick when she has a note about something when she wants something hit very specifically she knows exactly what to do you know it's, it's not like she never has a moment where she says i wonder what how this should be do you think we should do? you know she knows and she's been incredible to work with and really an honor i mean it, i never in my wildest dreams would have thought i'd, I'd be working with someone to say well you know when 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 bob stack was doing this when when bob was doing this and then, you know, she's helping me create this new chapter for them. It's a big responsibility, but I think we, you know, I hope listeners find that, you know, we've, we've found a way to tell the stories in this new medium. And I think it, I think these stories lend themselves to the podcast format. No matter what, what kind of story we're telling, you know, paranormal is obviously very spooky, but there are uh, you know, all these other investigations. They're, um, they really draw you in. And, and so you'll, you'll, you'll find as we go along throughout the season, some, some are a little more narration heavy, depending on how many details we need to fill in. And then others, sometimes I'm just popping in here and there to, to, to give some details about something. And, you know, of course, my favorite part is listening to the interviews and listening to the people who have experienced these things. So. Now, Steve, you might be biased. I'm going to ask the question anyway. Is the Unsolved Mysteries theme song the best theme song ever? Because I got to tell you, man, if it's not, it's it's up there. Isn't it one of the most visceral, incredible theme songs that has ever been written? I mean... When I found out, that was honestly, honestly, one of my things when, when I knew that I was going to get this job, I was almost afraid to ask because I was terrified that they were going to say, oh, we got both. a brand new theme song for, you know. Yeah. No, I mean, it was like, you have to have that theme song. And again, the idea that, that this kid who grew up watching that show, thrilling to the sound, you know, like right, you can feel that song mm -hmm. in your bones. And now that my voice is, is gets is heard over that theme song, it's you know a dream I never knew I had come true. It's amazing. Funny when I first when I started listening to the episode, I'm like, where is it? Where is it? And then I heard it. I'm like, okay, good. I can continue. This is good. Great. All right. We're good to go. And then I yeah. heard you, and I'm like, oh, this yeah, guy, yeah, this yeah. guy's good too. Yeah, let's keep listening to this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you think so. I'm glad you think so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it really is. That I, I I don't think they could do it without having that. You know. It's unsolved mysteries, right? I mean, that's what that's that's one of the things that people come for. And I think in our, uh, you know, there's in this day and age, right? We have, there's a lot of nostalgia. We we reboot a lot of mm -hmm. things. But I think unsolved mysteries, something that has always impressed me about them, especially in the last few years, is how they never seem to stop advancing with the times and trying out something new, trying out a new platform, adapting. You know, the way that they adapted the Netflix series, they, they sort of changed the change their format but still that same incredible storytelling i'm just really proud to be a part of it of course i'm biased and I'm, I've, I've been working with them for a while now and i'm very close to it but they just do a great job they know what they're doing steve really quickly before i let you go are there any upcoming episodes of the podcast that you can tease for us that you're really looking forward to having fans listen to where you're like yeah that's the one that's that's the one i'm really looking forward to there there certainly are i mean they're all in a way you know, I mean, so many people have a hand in them, but I, they're all in a way sort of my babies, you know, and, and I, 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 I'm very close to each of them. So I, I don't want to spoil anything for anybody. Let's just say there's, there's a wide range of things, and there's even a story that requires two episodes. I'll just, I'll just tease that for you. There might be a two-parter in, in your future here. So I don't, you know, I, I won't give, give any more weight to one over the other, but just know that there, there's a lot of different stories there'll be something new for you every week and, and something very exciting 
Two-parters are always juicy. Can't wait for that. And the rest of the episodes of the <laughs> Unsolved Mysteries podcast from Cadence 13 and Cosgrove Mirror Productions available everywhere you get your podcast. You can get them every Wednesday. And you'll hear this guy's voice at the beginning of every single one of them. It's Steve French. Thank you so much for joining me this week, man. James, thanks for your support. Thanks for having me on. Sure appreciate it. Take care, man. You know, you can hear the passion in his voice when he talks about unsolved mysteries and talk about he it's like you know he knows the responsibility that a narrator has for something like this and the storied history of this show and and to be putting it in this format he's absolutely right this really really is the perfect format for unsolved mysteries so yeah i love watching the show but hearing these episodes of this show it it, it doesn't lose anything for me I really love how the picture gets can, gets painted. I could put it in my mind. And if I want to Google what the place looks like or any of this stuff, I can do that. And I have that option. And having that call at action at the end was really, really neat. And not just seeing it on the screen, but hearing Steve say it. Get that narration. Get that, get that out there. It just really, really took me back to one of the things I really loved about the original Unsolved Mysteries. So make sure you're finding it wherever you find your podcast. Every Wednesday, a new episode of Unsolved Mysteries, narrated by, yeah, that guy, Steve French. Really, really love what they're doing there. Again, thanks to Steve French for joining me this week to talk about some Unsolved Mysteries. Up next, it's no mystery what we've got coming up. It's what we're reading, talking about comics, next on the Down and Nerdy Podcast. This writer, Christopher Sabella, you're listening to the Down and Nerdy Podcast. It's time to protect this house, whether it be on your pages or on your laptop, whatever you're reading on. It's time for what we're reading and back to Future State this week with House of L number one from DC Comics written by Philip Kennedy Johnson. Big surprise that I'm reviewing one of his books, right? Scott Godlewski on the art here. Gabe Atlab on the colors. ALW's Troy Petery on the letters and Yannick Paquette and Nathan Fairbairn with a really good cover, actually. This basically is the tale of the House of L from, you know, future, obviously. And what it really ends up being is an epic battle for the survival of the House of L itself. And this book, I will tell you right now, from the very beginning, it is like raining down bad guys. And there, there's just war all around. And this book wastes no time whatsoever getting to what's really happening and what the meat of this is. And I'm not really going to spoil too much about this book here, but really they have to serve as the last line of defense the House of L does for their sanctuary city and for Earth itself, actually, against the Red King. Now, I'm not going to spoil who the Red King is, but it's a very interesting reveal. And when you see that face and and what it represents in this story, it, it it's a little chilling. I'm not going to lie there. But, but you know, their, their forces, the House of Elves forces are really being overwhelmed. They find out that there's no help coming. Things are very, very dire. And Brainiac number four, though, might have actually found some hope, but the forces are fading fast. Is the hope going to get here? Does it even exist? Who knows? There's actually a couple of really tough losses, too, in this story, both family and extended family, that that really have, even in this short first issue, a real impact on 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 the story and 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 on you as a reader especially if you're if you're just a superman fan in general and not when i say superman i don't literally mean like clark kent i mean just the lore of superman itself i mean these are this is there's some hard stuff to take in this first issue when they do make their last stand though a very surprising and familiar figure appears to and this is the biggest spoiler save the day that's exactly what happens and 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 it's a really big moment and how it wraps up I mean, there's one of two ways that you could see it. You could go, wow, that that just shows you the power of that right there. Or really, it was that easy? I mean, I I can understand both perspectives. I kind I can t- tend to go the other way, saying that it was a, a very powerful moment. So that's just my take on that. But what this is, though, is a true Superman story because it's a constant message of hope and perseverance. That's what I got out of this first issue of House of L. It isn't about not wavering. It's actually about coming back and fighting for truth and justice is really how I looked at it as I was reading through this issue, especially when you come towards the end of this thing. Now, the art's really stunning in this book as well, and with so much action over so many pages, this team really, you could tell, work overtime 
on this issue. So credit to the entire art team. And I'm sure that when when Philip Kennedy Johnson saw these pages coming back, he's he was I'm, I'm not putting words in the guy's mouth, but I'm sure he was like, wow, I can't believe this is this is the finished product and came out so, so well because it really did. And the panels were arranged so well on the full page spreads. And that is a tricky thing to do actually you wouldn't you kind of take that for granted so yeah go ahead and this is actually one of my favorite future state issues house of l number one go ahead and grab that one and i'm very curious to see what you think about it now something very unique from image comics two moons number one and this is from john arcudi writing this one valerio gian giordano on the art dave stewart on the colors michael heisler on the letters, Bill Crabtree doing an assist on the colors for the cover art with G with Gian Giordano as well. Now, this is actually set during the Civil War, and it tells the story of Private Virgil Morris of the Union Army. Again, maybe just a few spoilers in this review. Now, Morris is also known by his Pawnee name of Two Moons. He's Native American, but he's really assimilated into what I'll call American culture. Now, the war is really taking its toll. It's the Civil War. Of course, it, of course it is. But Virgil keeps thinking that he's seeing these strange images and monstrous images. And, of course, you know, that's never a comfortable thing, right? So he's also getting reminded, though, of his true heritage here and there. Now, he's actually conflicted as to what to do. And what he's seeing is, is it just a byproduct of his mental state of, his, of the war or what's going on. But after he sees, or after a rebel attack, he sees something that tells him that it might not necessarily be a battle of good versus evil. It might be evil versus evil sort of thing. So what he does after that, though, his reaction to what he sees could have some dire consequences for him heading in to the next issue. And I have a feeling that, I mean, if things weren't tense enough already, they're about to get really tense, I think, in the second issue. We also get a story of an Irish immigrant nurse named Frances Shaw who is kind of learning of the evils of the world and the war. She's kind of an optimist as things start out. And then, you know, it seems like her eyes are starting to get open even a little bit in this first issue. Even though we don't see her much, I think we'll be seeing a lot more of her as the story goes on. This really fits in perfectly as kind of an alt-history horror story. It's very haunting, but it also has this element of real people in real situations as well. So it really balances a good you know, fictional history type vibe to it. It also gives us a portrayal of Native American characters as, you know, as he's just a soldier and not some stereotype. He's not a cliche. It's not a character that feels like it's forced in there. And this just seems like he's a Native American, but he's also a private in the Union Army. He's just a regular guy. He's just like everybody else. And I actually think that that's kind of cool and refreshing as someone who, who myself has a Native American heritage, it's not a big part of my heritage, but I definitely have some Native American heritage that I'm proud of. And I, it's, it's kind of refreshing to see that because it's not something that I see in stories very often. It'll be interesting to see how, though, that cliffhanger that I was kind of teasing at the end is dealt with in the next issue. And it's almost one of those cliffhangers like, like I don't know how this guy makes it out of the next issue. And you, you assume he probably does. So I can't wait to see how that works out. The art is really pristine in this. The line work is incredible in this book. And the colors really help to make those big horror moments pop. And when I say horror, I don't mean like jump scares. There's some eeriness to this, especially in the very beginning of, of this issue. Something very interesting happens. And you kind of see this play out throughout the issue as well. And you, you kind of look back on that and go, oh, well, I guess that was more important than I thought it was. So just pay really close attention to the beginning of this book as well. That's Two Moons, number one, from Image Comics. That's going to do it for what we're reading. Up next, we'll jump into some Spider-Man news and plenty more nude news from the week. Up next, I'm James Witham, and this is the Down and Nerdy Podcast. This is writer Peter David, and you're listening to the Down and Nerdy Podcast. All you need is a title. You've come to the right place. It's time for nerd news. And boy, did the cast of Spider-Man 3, I'll call it that for now, do they have fun with their title reveal this week for the third Spider-Man movie from Sony and Marvel Studios. Yeah, so you had Zendaya, you had Jacob Balaton, Batalon, excuse me, you had Tom Holland, all giving their versions of what they say the title was was going to be, I think it was like phone, Spider-Man phone home, then you had Spider-Man home slice, 
and then Spider-Man Home Wrecker. Then fans got involved. I'm surprised that there weren't stuff like Spider-Man Home Skillet, Spider-Man Patrick Mahomes, all this other different stuff. It was just, it was getting out of hand. And it got to the point where it was so popular. I, I remember when I actually wrote the original article for downandnerdypodcast.com, I actually said at the end, I said, look, it's not going to be long. Okay, and then people stayed up all night to watch The Tonight Show because Tom Holland was going to be on there. And he wasn't even promoting Spider-Man, by the way. He was promoting Cherry, which is coming on Apple TV, and expecting him to reveal the title there, which I never expected in a million years. I didn't think that he would do that at all. But, you know, a brilliant job of marketing on Tom Holland's part to get people to pay attention to his other movie by, I'm not going to say using Spider-Man, but certainly, you know, having a little bit of fun with it. And I'm not saying he tricked anybody, but if you watched expecting a title, then, hey, that's it's kind of on you. But, I mean, there are worse things, I suppose. But anyway, so then the next day, the very next day, like uh, almost hours later, we find out that the official title was revealed in a very clever video where it looks like they're being, you know, they're, they're upset because they were given fake names or whatever. And you see Spider-Man No Way Home on there, on the, on the board, and that is the official title for the third Spider-Man movie. So now this automatically makes you think, okay, so it's a multiverse type deal. They had to be sent to a different dimension by Doctor Strange because, you know, of what happened with Peter's identity being revealed. And now they're stuck there and they can't get back and they need to figure out a way. So, they, I mean, that seems plausible, right? We did see a couple of first look photos from the movie that, I mean, you can read into it what you want, revealed nothing. Revealed absolutely nothing. And that's fine, too, by the way. I don't need anything to be revealed right now, but it did also reiterate this will be only in theaters on December 17th. So only in theaters at Christmas is what it actually said. So I get it. No problem with that at all. By December, hopefully that is going to be an option for us all to be able to go to a movie theater and actually enjoy a movie again. I kind of hope that it's long before that. Maybe you've already been going to the movies, but you know, if you still don't feel safe going to the movies, hopefully by December, We'll all be able to go watch Spider-Man and enjoy it. But I think this was actually a brilliant little gag that they did. They got to have a little bit of fun with it. Certainly got fans involved, and the interest was at such a peak. I think they decided, you know what, let's just, yeah, let's reveal this title now. and strike while the iron's hot. More brilliant marketing from Disney, from Marvel Studios, from Sony. Well done there. And as far as Tom Holland's future Spider-Man after this, his contract is up. Who knows? Too early to speculate. And are Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield really in the movie? Tom Holland says no. That almost makes me feel like they're in it even more. Because Tom Holland has spoiled so much in the past. And of course he's not going to spoil this. So, I don't know. kind of makes me think that they're in it even more. We'll have to wait and see on December the 17th. Probably find out before then, though. Disney and Marvel weren't done there, though. They actually revealed a bunch of different date release dates for Disney+. Plus and their series as well. It wasn't just Marvel stuff, though. I'm going to highlight a few of these. I'm actually looking forward to Mighty Ducks Game Changers on March March 26th. I don't know about you, but having Gordon Bombay back and having Mighty Ducks back in a, as a series, I think that's going to be really cool. So I don't, know, I don't know how excited you are for that, but I'm super excited. May the 4th be with you. Going to be the release of Star Wars Bad Batch, the Bad Batch, the animated series. That's going to be a special release on May the 4th, though. Another new episode is going to premiere on May the 7th. That'll be its regular release day is on that uh, on that friday so and new, we finally know that loki is going to premiere on june the 11th i circled that one because i think that's the one that everybody's kind of looking the most forward to how could you not i mean especially after how great wandavision's been no i'm not going to talk about wandavision this week because i want to be able to talk spoilers we're waiting till next week and that's final okay so let's just let's just get that out of the way right now so i think that's the one that that fans are most excited for in this list just in general and then just taking a look at a couple of more of these, you've got Monsters at Work, which is the continue, well, spinoff of the Monsters, Inc. movies. It's going to happen on July the 2nd. You also have Chippendale, Chippendale Park Life, which is Chippendale Rescue Rangers, essentially, and that's going to be on July the 23rd. There's a few more mixed in there that, that, that you might be interested in. Go to the, get the full list at downandnerdypodcast.com. But, I mean, you look at this, and you've got March, April, May, June, July, and the only thing we don't have up here is August. And that means pretty much every month from March through summer, you're going to have something new to watch on Disney Plus, multiple things at certain points, too. So, again, this is a brilliant job of Disney Plus. Really, this is really their first wave, I think. 
this is their first initial push into, okay, we put out a couple of series that were really successful. Now here comes our full court press. Here comes us pushing all of our chips in the middle of the table, and we are fully in this thing now. This is them showing what they've really got. And I, I'm very, very excited to see how some of these series do. Think about it. Even even if half of them are good or even close to as successful as the Mandalorian and WandaVision, and we already know we've got Boba Fett to, to look forward to later this year as well, Book of Boba Fett. So if any of these, if half of these series are half as successful as those, it's still going to be a win. For Disney, because there's there's reports that One Division is already more popular than Bridgerton was on Netflix, and Bridgerton is Netflix's most successful series ever. So think about that for a second. If One Division is already more popular than that, that says a lot, and that is definitely a good sign for the future of Disney Plus. Here's something that you probably have heard me talk about before. Yeah, it was on episode 242. Of the podcast, yeah, this is 356. That's how long this. That's how long this has been, potentially in the works. But a new Blue Beetle movie is going to be in the works once again. This one is going to focus on Jamie Reyes, too. By the way, so which I think is a very smart, smart move. That's a much more fun character to focus on, and then Ted Cord. I just I don't think that that would have worked at all. This was first reported. By the rap, Warner Brothers DC working on this adaptation with Angel Manuel, Manuel Soto of Charm City Kings going to be doing the directing, the script by Gareth Dunant Alucer, who did Miss Bala. I know I'm butchering these names, I apologize. And Zev Foreman's going to be the executive producer. This is also going to be the first Mexican American led superhero movie from DC. So I think that this is a really cool thing. That's that's gonna. Ha- I mean, is this actually gonna happen though? I'm still kind of skeptical. It's a, it's like a believe it when I see it sort of thing, because it feels like they've already tried to do this several times. We had that in the first the first time they tried to announce this was in 2018. That didn't actually happen. Then it seemed like they were gonna work this character, or at least an iteration of the character of Blue Beetle, into the Arrowverse. That never actually happened, even though they teased it a little bit here and there. And then there was also more rumblings of possibly a live action series. That didn't really happen. Sure, we saw Blue Beetle in in Young Justice. That's animation. I don't really count that as much. You've got the DC Showcase animated short that's going to be coming at some point within the next year of Blue Beetle. So that's cool. But we need a live action Blue Beetle at some point. And the reason why I'm skeptical about this is that it's they seem to find reasons to not make some of these movies, and I don't understand why that is. And and it has nothing to do with anything other than the fact that Blue Beetle is not an A-list character. You might like the character, but again, any character that is not an A-list character that you're going to give their own movie to, or is not like a Justice League type member, I'm wary that it's going to get made at all, especially with budgets being tightened the way that they are right now. And everything kind of being, you know, up in the air with with all of the losses that have happened financially because of the pandemic. I I don't know. I'm skeptical. I hope this actually does happen because I think it could be a really cool, really fun movie, like a Shazam-esque really fun movie that they could make. So I hope it does happen. But I'm thinking about all the money that they're going to be spending on movies like Black Adam and things like that coming up. And I don't know. I really hope this does happen. I just don't think it's going to be anytime soon even though they say they're going to start production in the fall if you're going to do that you better cast quickly like quickly i know the fall isn't that isn't that close but this is the kind of thing that sneaks up on you really fast so i would get out in front of this and get this at least the casting part moving really really quickly how about miguel from cobra kai from for jamie reyes what do you think zolo what do you think come on think about that for a second let me know at down and nerdy at down and nerdy seven five seven on social media. Let me know what you think. Here's something that I wasn't expecting to find out, and certainly not in this destination, is that a GI Joe live action series is going to be coming to Amazon of all places. This, according to G- to Deadline, it's going to focus on Lady J, and this course is going to be from Hasbro's E1 Studio, and it's going to focus on her undercover missions. We don't really know much. Beyond that, no word if Adrian Palicki is going to re- reprise her role from G.I. Joe Retaliation. Uh, yeah, I kind of doubt it. I don't think that they'll probably go that route because this is going to tie into the new G.I. Joe 
movie universe, which is going to start with the Snake Eyes origin movie on October the 22nd from Paramount. Now, whether or not it'll come out on, on, on October 22nd, well, that's another conversation for another day. But here's one thing that I, I think this, first of all, this is going to be a cool show. I think, I think Lady J is a great character to focus on. And I think that Amazon's actually got a good track record with stories like this. What I find interesting, though, is that how much Hasbro diversifies the networks that all of their stuff is on. Sure, all of their movies are made by Paramount so far. But at the same time, like they've got a new Transformers animated series, Bot Bots, that's going to be coming to Netflix. They've already done several Transformers things with Netflix. Now you've got G.I. Joe on Amazon. And quite frankly, I'm, I'm kind of shocked with all this push for Paramount Plus right now. It's going to be CBS All Access just going to become Paramount Plus on March the 4th. I'm surprised that that's not where this show is landing, actually. And maybe because it's been in the works for a while that that's not going to that's not going to happen. But they're not keeping it in the Paramount family. And I think that that is an interesting thing. Not the wrong call, by the way. Not the wrong decision at all. I think Amazon is a great choice for this series. I'm just surprised that with all of the things that Paramount Plus announced this week at their TCA presentation, that this G.I. Joe series could have been a marquee thing for them, and they didn't get it. I just find that very, very interesting, and it just goes to show you how much control Hasbro has over their own properties, and I think that that's a great thing for them, an absolutely great thing. So, yeah, yeah. G.I. Joe, if you put the G.I. Joe name on it, I'm interested already, but I think this could be a really, really cool thing. I can't wait to see find out more about this series in the coming months. A couple of trailers that came out this week I want to talk about. First one is The Irregulars from Netflix. going to be out on March the 26th. And it's really a dark kind of Sherlock Holmes type story. And what it actually focuses on is a group of, I mean, misfits for the lack of a better term. It's actually going to be based on the Baker Street Irregulars gang from the original books from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. So that's a really, really cool thing. And it's basically these kids that, I say kids, they're teenagers. They're sort of manipulating into solving crimes for, and I'm quoting this from the synopsis, the sinister Dr. Watson and his mysterious business partner, the elusive Sherlock Holmes. So basically these crimes are like supernatural crimes. There's dark powers involved. And, you know, it paints Watson and Holmes as like these kind of shady, creepy characters which is something that we're not really used to seeing. Now, the teaser that was released didn't, again, didn't reveal much, but it paints a very bleak and dark picture. And we are not used to getting a dark version of Sherlock Holmes at all. And this one looks like it could be the darkest one yet. Now, granted, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, not the focus of this series, but they are very much major players in the series. I th- at least I think they're going to be. Once we find out when the show actually comes out on March 26th, we'll find out just how important they're going to be. I think the large focus is going to be on these teenagers and this group that are solving these crimes. But at the same time, I think seeing these two characters that we come to know a certain way in a completely different light is going to be a super interesting twist on the story plus i mean supernatural horror like crimes going on on the streets of london and there and everything just seems really really dark this could be a really cool brooding type series so i'm really really digging what i've seen so far of the regulars from this trailer and i can't wait to see more and yeah you know i'll have a review for you when this thing comes out One more time to brighten things up as we end things here with Luca from Disney Pixar, the brand new movie that's going to be coming out this summer. And if you saw the teaser trailer, it just looks like so much fun. You've got these two teenagers, and and one of them is Luca Parugo, Paguro, excuse me, who's going to be played by Jacob Tremblay. And then you've also got Jack Dylan Grazer's character of Alberto. And these are just two kids that want to have the best summer ever. And I love that. And you see them just, you know, having gelato, riding bikes, running around, having a lot of fun. Oh, by the way, they happen to be sea monsters in an area where they don't really like sea monsters. And there's images everywhere of people killing sea monsters. So, yeah, you kind of don't want people to find out that you're a sea monster, even though you're kids. But the tone of this 
trailer, the teaser was so light, so fun. And Pixar does that so, so well. They can do serious as well. They can do stuff that's a little deeper. And I'm sure that this movie will be will have its its moments of being a little deeper. But at the same time, this just looks like it's going to be so much fun. It's going to be a feel good type movie. And I think that that's something that Pixar has definitely needed. They've had they've had some serious stuff lately. And I thought I like that they're going to lighten things up a little bit with Luca. And again, I'm sure that there's going to be some serious moments because it's still a Disney movie, right? But at the same time, this looks like it's going to be a heck of a lot of fun. And I cannot wait to check this out with my son when this comes out later this summer. That's going to do it for this week's edition of the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Again, thanks to my many, many guests this week and also our sponsor, Care Of. Make sure you go to TakeCareOf.com, enter promo code NERDY50. That's NERDY50 to get 50% off your first order at Care Of. If you want more information about what we've got going on, and it's a lot, Go to downandnerdypodcast.com. Also, follow along on social media at downandnerdy757 on Twitter and on Instagram and at downandnerdy on Facebook. Remember, you never have to apologize for being a nerd, so let your fan flag fly and be good to your fellow nerds.